Good morning, Arbor. I'm Garrett, one of the teaching pastors here at Arbor. And wherever you're joining us from this morning, welcome. Thanks for allowing me to be part of your day. It's been a bummer not to be able to see everyone on a regular basis. I miss your faces. But a couple really cool, unexpected things have come as a result uh, of the coronavirus and how it impacts us as a church. One of them is the ability to stream our content and still be able to meet in this way. I'm grateful for that. A lot of you guys are early adopters. You've hopped on and are engaging in these messages. You've also discovered the comments section there on YouTube and Facebook. And so if you haven't, I want to encourage you. It's like a virtual lobby. It's a really cool way before the message and even during the message to say hi to one another, to talk about points that stood out to you, talk about how ruggedly handsome the guy speaking right now is. You know, I mean, just an idea to throw out there to you. And uh, the other thing that's been really cool is the daily devotions that have been happening on the social media platform. If you didn't know, we started pushing out daily content a couple weeks ago. There are about three minute videos of various people within the Arbor community that are sharing with us various things that God's put on their heart and their mind, focusing on dispensing hope and encouragement during this time, because how many of us know we could use hope and encouragement in this season? And so lots of you are already watching those and uh, engaging with them. You're commenting and, and uh, telling the person that was sharing how what they shared stood out to you and what it meant to you. So thanks, because that means a lot when God puts someone on their heart, something on someone's heart and they share it to hear that it also meant something to you. So uh, if you're not doing that, check it out. Around eight o'clock every morning, we're posting these things. Hop on there, leave a comment, let them know what you think, what stood out to you. It's pretty cool that even though we can't be together in person, we can still be together and we can keep Jesus at the center of our conversation. So couple things in the midst of all this upheaval to what used to be our normal God brings some really cool stuff out of that today I'm continuing our series on Peter where we're taking a look at the life of Peter and asking ourselves the question what can we learn about Jesus through the apostle through the disciple Peter today I'm going to be looking at one of the most pointed and um, important questions Jesus ever asked the question is this Who do you say that I am? It comes out of Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look at Peter's response and what comes out of that dialogue between he and Jesus and the other disciples. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to jump right into Matthew 16 and read through this and then bring a little context to it. So the words will be up there on the screen. Follow along with me. We're in Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter piped up and he answered, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail. What did Jesus mean when he said, on this rock I will build my church? I'll tell you, this is highly debated, and um, there's a lot of different opinions out there. The Catholic Church and the tradition of the Pope comes out of the belief that Jesus meant Peter specifically, because Peter's name means rock. So they believe that Jesus was saying, on you, Peter, I will build my church. Many people believe it was a nod to the geographic location, Caesarea Philippi, because it was famous for this massive rock in which the city was built on top of. And yet many believe that it was a statement towards Peter's declaration of faith of you are the Messiah and that based on that confession of faith, I will build my church. So who's right? (laughs) I have no idea. 
<laughs> I really don't. People come at you with strong opinions and it seems like fact, like they know, but I would submit to you, no one knows definitively what Jesus actually meant. I do have an opinion about it and I'm gonna share that opinion with you. It's just an opinion, but I, I wanna help bring some context so that you can form your own thoughts and opinions around this. I think to truly understand Jesus' response, you have to see how deeply entrenched it was in the geography of Caesarea Philippi, where this exchange, where this Q&A takes place. And I had some great pictures to help you visualize it, because I think that'd be helpful, but because we're streaming everything online, I didn't want to rip off someone's content, and I didn't want to get Arbor in trouble over usage rights. So I'm going to do my best to paint a picture with my words, so engage your creativity, engage your imagination, and go with me here. The area is Caesarea Philippi. As I mentioned earlier, known, made famous for the massive rock on which the ancient city was built on. Before it was Caesarea Philippi, it was occupied by the Greeks, and it was known as Peneus, and it was the center of worship for the Greek god Pan. It was dominated by immoral activities and pagan worship. And if you'd picture in your mind just a giant, massive rock, what comes to my mind is Yosemite Valley. If you've ever been there, seen pictures of it, and on one side you've got El Capitan just way up into the sky. On the other side, you've got Half Dome doing the same thing. And if you've ever been there or seen pictures of it, by the time people are up at the top of these things, you can hardly even see them. They look like ants. That's how high up they are. And this is where the conversation takes place. And I, I drew a little picture, my, uh, my kindergarten art, to try and help explain this a little bit. This is not the entirety of the rock. This is just a little piece of the rock. And the top of it where the city is built would be way, way up here, way above the rock. And what you'll notice is there's these outcroppings, these nooks, these crannies that are carved into the rock. And they house the statues. The largest one housed Pan, the main statue and idol they worshipped. And around it was his nymph entourage. This was the first century equivalent to a red light district. People would come and commit deplorable acts of worship to the Greek god Pan. Right next to Pan's statue was a massive cave. That's what that circle depicts next to his statue opening. And this was a well, a, a spring, a cave that led to a spring. It was never known how deep it was. They made many, many attempts, but they never were able to measure how deep it was and find the bottom. So in the pagan mind, they believed that this cave led directly to the underworld. It was called the Gates of Hades. Isn't that interesting? So this is the backdrop in which this conversation is happening that Jesus is having, having with his disciples. They're at a city, Caesarea Philippi, known for the rock on which the city is built on. It's dominated by pagan worship and immoral activity. And there is a cave that leads to a place that is believed by the pagans to be the underworld, the center of the earth, and they call it the Gates of Hades. I think that is so interesting. Regardless of who's right and what you believe, what's happening here is super, super significant. A place that was known for a city built on the hill, now we are getting a church built on a relationship. A place that was known for worship of false dead gods is now being exchanged for a living heavenly father. And a well that led to death is being exchanged for rivers of living water. I just think the imagery in this is so cool and so amazing. And I, I gotta tell you, I would love to sit on this and geek out on it and continue to dive deep into it because there's a lot of really neat things to, to look at and uncover, but I don't want us to lose the forest for the tree. I think there's a much, much, much bigger picture going on here. And if we get too focused on just this, we miss the majesty and the splendor and just the, wow, the awesome nature of the entirety of the forest. And so I wanna go back 
and continue to look at Matthew 16, starting at verse 13 where we started before, and look a little bit deeper into a couple of things that Jesus says. Notice Jesus didn't start off by asking, who do people say I am? He asked a really general question. He said, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Now, Jesus had referred to himself as the Son of, the, uh, Son of Man many times. But prior to Jesus, the Son of Man was a term that Jews were very familiar with. They, they equated that to the Messiah. They believed that the Messiah was going to come, that he would be special, that he would be set apart, that he would be chosen by God. But here's what's interesting. It was never discussed that the Messiah would be God himself. And so when Jesus asked this question, it's really specific and interesting. Hey, what's the word on the street about the Son of Man? And recognize the disciples don't say anything about Jesus. The disciples say, well, some say it was John the Baptist, some say it was Elijah, some say it was Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What's interesting about that, those are all great people, highly, highly regarded in Jewish custom, but they're all dead. John the Baptist was just killed two chapters ago in Matthew chapter 14. And so they're saying, they, we don't know. We, we're not sure. Some believe it was these different people. Maybe we missed it. Maybe the Messiah's already come. We're not sure. And then Jesus leans in and he looks at them and he gets real personal. He says, what about you guys? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, his response is really, really incredible groundbreaking, earth-shattering for a couple reasons. Because the first thing he says is, you're him. You're the Messiah. You are the one we've been waiting for. It's amazing. And the second thing he said was really interesting. He says, you're the son of the living God. He didn't say you're the son of man. He said, you're the son of the living God. And what that was was a divinity statement, a claim of divinity. And that's why I believe Jesus responds so strongly and says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed to this to you. Human wisdom did not reveal this to you. Your teachings, your rabbis, your coaches, your texts, your parents, your culture did not teach you this. This was divinely revealed to you. This was a rhema word of God directly into your spirit by my Father in heaven. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail. That's incredible. It's just incredible. It, it, this, this changes everything. We'll, we'll see in a moment that the book of Matthew literally pivots at this exact moment. It, it changes everything. And I think Jesus is saying, based on that declaration, based on that confession of faith, a belief in me that I am the Messiah, I am the chosen one of God, and I am God himself, come to earth with skin on, and I am going to be your redeemer, your savior. It's incredible. It changes everything. It, the, the rest of human history will never be the same again. It's based on that that a movement starts, that a revolution starts. It is absolutely incredible. So if we go from there, and we look at what happens immediately next. This massive moment, right? Peter is just the hero. Their minds are blown and now we pivot. I said the book of Matthew changes, and you're about to see it because what happens is we go from Jesus teaching, performing miracles, all of these things that we've read about up to this point, and now he is about to tell his disciples and tell us what his purpose is. Now we're about to focus on what was all of that stuff we had talked about and learned for. And here he goes into purpose. Verse 21 from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. You got to think about this for a second, right? They just had this huge moment, and now Jesus is saying, I'm going to go suffer and be persecuted, and I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to leave you. Like, wait, what? So how does Peter respond? Verse 22, 
Peter took him aside. Remember, Peter just made a statement of divinity. Peter just said, you're God. So Peter takes the God-man aside and rebukes God and says, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus had some very strong words for Peter. He turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have the mind, you don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Listen to that. You don't have in mind the concerns of God. You have in mind human concerns. Then he turns to the rest of the disciples in verse 24 and says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. I want to read Eugene Peterson's version of this out of the message. I love how he says these last two verses. He says, then Jesus went to work on the disciples. Anyone who intends to come to me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way to finding yourself your true self. Man, it's incredible. I think that's so applicable for today. We have these moments of revelation where we believe, God, you're so good. I declare you, Jesus is my Messiah, my Lord, my Savior, only for a moment later or a day later to have something in our lives turned upside down, our normal disrupted, and we go into fear, into anxiety. Whatever it is, we go internal and search ourselves. How do I deal with this? How do I fix this thing? But we can't control our circumstances. We can't control this virus. We don't even really understand it yet. It's so new. Many of us can't control our employment situation, whether or not we're going to get another paycheck, our income. We miss community. We miss our friends. We miss our family. We're doing the best we can. Thank God for some of the stuff technology allows us with Zoom calls and FaceTime and some of these other ways people are coming up with really cool, innovative ways to hang out together. But we can't control this, and it is scary. And Peter and the disciples probably felt really similar. This guy that they had gotten so close to is now found out to not just be a great teacher, he's the Messiah. He's not just the Messiah. He's God made flesh. And right after this revelation, he tells them, it's not what you think. I'm not your political redeemer. I'm not just here to restore Israel to its right standing as the chosen people of God and the chosen nation of God and free you from the oppressors of the, the, the oppression of the Romans. It's much, much bigger than that. And because of that, this is what has to happen. This is my purpose. And it's freaking them out. Two main things we learn about Jesus from the life of Peter in these passages. First is the single greatest question you can ever ask of and answer yourself is who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? Is he the Messiah? Is he the one that was promised? Is he the son of God that loved you so much that he left the comfort of his home in heaven to come and take your place? to be a ransom for you, to give his life for you, not to just save a few chosen people or a chosen nation, but for anyone and everyone that would believe in him. Is that who he is to you? Because I believe if you make that claim, if you declare that with your mouth and you believe that in your heart, that Jesus is Lord and is your Redeemer, that it is based on that confession of faith that the rest of your life will be built. He'll take emptiness and trade it in for completeness. He'll take death and trade it for life. He'll take water that leaves you thirsty for living water and you'll never thirst again. This is what he's offering you. Who do you say Jesus is? 
The second thing I think we learn about Jesus from Peter and his in interaction with him is that you have to lose your life in order to find it. You have to lose your life in order to find it. And that's why I read Eugene Peterson's translation because I love how he puts it. We're not in control. We only think we are. Jake talked about this a couple weeks ago. I just loved it. The idea of Peter stepping out of the boat and leaving the safety of the boat. But the boat was just a facade. It was a facade of safety. Real safety was in the arms of Jesus. And we're back to that again. Jesus isn't asking you, hey, let me be boss. Jesus is saying, it's a lie. You can't control this stuff, but I can. And if you would make this declaration with your life and trust in me, put your faith in me, you actually, in doing so, will find it. It's a completely upside down way of thinking of how we've been raised and been taught to believe. But Jesus is saying, hey, you can drive the car, and think we are in relationship because you're asking me for directions, or you can just open the door and get out and let me be in the driver's seat, and then you can ride shotgun with me, man, and just enjoy the ride. That's what Jesus is offering. And I think another thing that's so cool as we look at Peter and many of the great heroes of the Bible is that we relate to them because they mess up, right? Peter had this moment where he made the discovery. Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of the living God. And then immediately just totally messed up and got the harshest rebuke I think I've seen anyone get from Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. And a lot of times we're comforted by that, right? Because, okay, Peter and the other great men and women of the Bible, they're just human, just like us. They mess up. They screw up. And yet they're a part of a very important story. And so we find comfort in that but it's not a cop-out because that's not what we aspire toward we learn through this story just as we do through a whole lot of the scriptures that jesus has grace for days forever with us he gives us second and third and fourth and infinity chances and he forgives us and welcomes us back into the fold but I want to read one more passage of scripture to you that I think relates well to this story and perfectly fits the season we find ourselves in right now in April 2020. It comes out of Hebrews, if I can find it. Yeah, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. The writer says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. This, the word of God, is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit. It's so specific. It's so precise. It goes exactly where it needs to go. It cuts between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. For what purpose? It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The word of God, if we allow it, if we open it up and we read it, not to read the same stories we've always read before and to hear the same teachings we've always heard before, but if we open this up and we say, Father, I believe your word is alive and active. The spirit, your spirit resides in it. I pray that you would open me up to what you have to say to me through this. Expose to me my unbelief. Where? do my thoughts and my actions deviate from my stated beliefs? Because that's what's happening to Peter in this story. I believe you're God. I believe you're Messiah. And yet I'm scared. I don't want to lose you, right? Peter uh, gets rebuked when he says this can't be so. Then just a couple chapters later, we see him as Jesus is getting arrested by Roman soldiers. He's scared to lose Jesus, so he cuts off a, Roman's, a Roman soldier's ear. And then shortly after that, he denies any sort of relationship with Jesus in an attempt to save himself. He continues to slip up and screw up, yet Jesus has grace for him. But when we read this, we realize we're just like that. There are so many times in our lives that the thoughts that bubble up and the ways that we behave are inconsistent with our belief system. But if you 
look to God and you look to his word and you truly say to yourself and say to God, I want to close that gap between my thoughts and actions and my belief. I want to, my thoughts and actions to come more closely to my belief. Will you let the word of God search your innermost thoughts and desires? As we go through this time and this season and fear runs rampant, it's all around us and, and it's okay to be concerned. It's okay to be afraid. There's some really scary stuff going on with our health, with our finances, our livelihood. But at the end of the day, Jesus didn't promise that he'd tap us with a magic wand and fix all that stuff. What Jesus said, he said it to these, hey, look, we're going into a tough season. It's gonna get chaotic and I'm gonna get killed. That's what's going on in this story. So we know that we're gonna go through tough times, but he's saying it's in the midst of all that that you can find your hope, that you can find your safety, that you can find your security in me. It's through letting go of control and giving me the steering wheel that you're actually gonna find yourself, your true self. Friends, that's the best news that has ever existed. If you're watching today and you've never made that decision in your life that you want to place your hope in Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity to do so right now. Scripture tells us that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved and you will secure your eternity in heaven with him. And so all you have to do is just say that breath prayer. Just say that where you're at right now. Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior and believe that you gave your life as a ransom for me. And it's done. It's done. And then, for you now and the rest of us, the great news is that's just the beginning. Now, he's revealing his purpose to us, our purpose to us. And now, we can spend the rest of our time here on earth allowing the scriptures and allowing the voice of God to search our innermost thoughts and desires and transform them to renew our mind, to renew our thinking into being more like him. Last thing, as we do that, we go back to Matthew chapter five where Jesus says, you are a light set on top of a hill for everyone to see. No one turns on a lamp and covers it with a, a basket or a blanket. No, you turn on a light so it casts light so you can see it. And we can be his representation, not just simply through the good deeds we do. Um, I think a lot of times we do stuff because that makes us feel good and, and, and it keeps us from having to actually look at our own thoughts and desires and what are we actually afraid of. But as we actually begin to find hope and peace in Jesus and rest in that, people are gonna go, those people are legitimately different. I want what they have. I want that peace. And we become this city sit on a hill. I don't think it's coincidence that he said that in Matthew chapter five and now he's preaching this thing or having this conversation with the disciple at another city set on top of a hill, a big rock. John chapter one, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the word and it goes on in verse five to say, and the light shined in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. Church, we are the hope of the world. And if we are able to let go of control if we are able to declare Jesus as King, as Messiah, as our Savior, and we're willing to lose our lives in order to find it, we will be the greatest beacon of hope in this season and for the rest of eternity. Can I pray for you? Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that it does expose our innermost thoughts and desires and thank you that you don't just teach a lesson you model it for us by example you walked this road you went through pain you went through chaos through tribulation and you offer us in the midst of it hope and so we cling on to that we accept it we name you as our redeemer as our savior as our teacher and we ask that you would reveal to us where in our hearts are our thoughts and desires inconsistent 
with our stated belief. We want to be more like you, and we want to be your light that shines bright for all the world to see. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being part of this and again welcoming me into a portion of your life. And I believe there are better days ahead because Jesus is king and sitting on his throne and he loves you and he's there to give you peace and hope. Thanks for joining us online here at Arbor. If you enjoyed watching, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on whatever social media platform you use. Maybe you're interested in joining a group, volunteering, or just want to get to know us more. Visit our website, arborchurch.com. I hope you have a great day and thanks for watching.